Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Building a Sustainable Accessibility Program. We're delighted to have you with us. And now I'm gonna go ahead and pass the webinar session over to Jeff. Thanks so much, Bethany. Uh, as Bethany mentioned, I'm the VP of Accessibility Operations here at UsableNet. And one of the things that I get to do, and it's absolutely one of my favorite things to do in my role, is work with our clients to help them understand how to create a sustainable accessibility program in their own organizations. And I'm so excited to be here with Heather today to talk about the journey that she's had at Skyscanner. And a great place for us to start, Heather, is to have you introduce yourself to everyone and talk about your role and the journey that you had at Skyscanner and how you ended up in the role that you're in. Sure, thanks, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. It was lovely to be here and chatting to you. Um, yeah, I'm Heather. I'm the head of accessibility at Skyscanner. Um, and for those who don't know us, we are a global online travel marketplace. Um, so we provide flights, hotels and cars to our 110 million active users every month. Um, we have 1,400 staff across eight offices, started out in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, I work from the Glasgow office. And yeah, I've been there for five and a half years now. So I, I started there as a UX writer um, or content designer, kind of similar, similar role. Um, and it was actually during my interview process there that they asked me to do a UX critique of the Skyscanner app. And that's when I realized that they were not looking at accessibility at all. Um, it was really clear to me, and this was just from looking at it, that I wasn't even listening to it on a screen reader at this point. And um, just visually, I could tell that there was no thought to accessibility. And I'd come from um, RBS, for, where I'd been working for a number of years uh, with, with a very... Um, a very proactively accessible team. So we were building accessible stuff just as a matter of course. And um, yeah, it was just really obvious to me that this wasn't happening at Skyscanner. So I, I, I very quickly got on a bit of a mission and um, yeah, got some balls rolling and ended up writing a job description for myself really. And thankfully I was allowed to do it. So I've been running the program for about four years. Um, and yeah, it's been great. So for me, that that means um, there's really me and I now have one lead accessibility engineer. So there's only two of us in the team, um, but we do use some freelancers and we have partners um, like UsableNet and um, other, other agencies and, and companies. Um, but I'm really focused on the strategy, the accessibility strategy, um, raising awareness across the business continually, um, improving um, adoption of best practice and, um, and really trying to increase advocacy um, around accessibility. So there's, there's a, lot, um, a lot to cover, but yeah, it's, it's great. I'm also the co-founder of a, an external group called the Champions of Accessibility Network or CAN. Um, if any of your listeners are interested in that, it's a, it's a LinkedIn group um of accessibility professionals or people who are just interested in accessibility um we we chat online and we have a monthly um zoom meetup sometimes we have an in-person meetup as well in different cities around the world and it's a great it's a great group of um kind of like-minded people and we we all kind of help each other and and share and bethany's actually just popped the link to that group in the chat i see so um if you're interested please come along and and, and say hello yeah, it's, it's a great group. Uh, so hopefully we can get more people here into that group so they can start benefiting from the hive mind, if you will. What made digital accessibility so important for you to get involved in and start to advocate for? You certainly had the background at RBS, but what just brought it all forward into Skyscanner that you, you know, went about setting your own job description even? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I really have a problem with injustice. Like if something, and a particularly injustice that is not understood. So Skyscanner were unknowingly excluding people. And I think that was that was the big thing for me. Um, I don't want anyone to be excluded from doing anything that they want to do. And um, it was just a really obvious one to me. So it was a real challenge to that I couldn't turn away from. I, I just wanted I wanted everyone to be able to use this great app um, and great website and 
Um, there was, yeah, there was nothing I could do about it really. And once I started, that was it. Um, it was also around about the time we received an email from um, a blind traveler and he was basically saying, look, I can't use your stuff. It's it's terrible. And I had some good conversations with him and, uh, but actually now friends, um, but he, yeah, I, that was a real um, catalyst as well for me to, to sort this out for him and the, the disabled community. Mm -hmm. And once you start understanding what the issues are, and you got it from a firsthand person there, there you, you can't not pay attention to them once you know about them. Exactly. Yeah. How do you go about it? Explain the importance of accessibility to your Skyscanner, you know, colleagues and up and down like the leadership, uh, because so many even today still haven't heard of it. And then you've kind of got to want to bring them into the fold so they become champions on their own. Yeah, I normally start with the numbers because I think they're quite hard hitting. So in the UK, we're now at one in four um, people have a permanent disability. Um, and I explain what that means, because I think a lot of people think about the stereotypes of someone in a wheelchair or a blind person with a guide dog. And it's just so much more than that. So I I try and make that really clear. Um I also talk about permanent, temporary and situational disabilities and talk about that, you know, they happen to us all every day. So uh, whatever we're doing in terms of accessibility, it's benefiting every single one of us. Um, but then, yeah, it depends who I'm talking to, really, but I try and make it quite personal. So if it's somebody who has um, someone close to them with a disability, so like a, a child with dyslexia, say then I, I can talk about well, what we would be doing in order to help um, that person read our content more easily. You know, trying to just make it more, more personal so that people really get it. Or if it's an older person, showing them actually on their phone how to enlarge text and what that actually means and, and how some apps don't quite work with your text settings and what that means. Um, and, and then just showing just showing people I do like to kind of do the demo of this is what it means this is how you navigate by a keyboard this is what a screen reader sounds like and I think once it becomes um relatable that's when pennies drop and people go all right yeah I get that and I'm behind that yeah even with the advocacy that you've built over these four years how do you go about perhaps developing new business cases, but also strengthening the business case. Because I imagine like any organization, there's always the revisiting of, is this initiative, does it need to keep going? Does it get budgeted? How do we keep you know, growing it? Or does it, where does it fall on prioritizations? How do you handle all that? Like both thinking about it from the beginning as you were doing this, but also now, you know, four years in, how you're still having to make the case. I think I've been really lucky with this, actually, because um, we, we are a very, very inclusive organization. And as soon as leadership heard that we were excluding people and they understood what that meant, um, there was no question that, you know, they weren't going to support us. So I, I think I've been very, very lucky. Um, the business case, I remember that when I first went to get that funding, that initial funding at the very beginning, um, I focused on the model benefits um, or the moral reasons to do accessibility um, and that was all about inclusion um, and not wanting to exclude anyone and and really I, I don't didn't really have to go much further than that but um the commercial reasons are clear you know you're you're increasing your um your customer base um by quite a long way which obviously means in, increased revenue and the disabled community are very loyal. So when there's not a lot out there that works well for them. So when something does, they really want to talk about it, share, um, share the stories with their community and, you know, it's and, and stay with you. So there's, there's benefits there. And when I started talking about the benefits around SEO as well, um, we have a really big SEO team and um, it's very important to us. So, those when the links are talked about between you know if you've got a an accessible site the the automatic benefits to SEO and vice versa um when, when that's explained that that really helps as well um and then of course you've got the the legal side thankfully that hasn't had to be a big thing um so much for us because we were you know keen on the other two reasons but then the the EAA or the European Accessibility Act coming now. So 
if you're talking about yeah that that's something that's changed actually but when I started talking about accessibility I wasn't really talking much about the legal side of things um but now that is 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 very front of mind for me and um now front of mind for the business so by June next year we have to we have to be compliant so we're just still actually working out what parts of our um our products are in scope but because it's it's always been on like a, a low down reason um I kind of want to keep it like that but it's just I, I need to make the business aware of you know the repercussions if we don't if we don't meet if, if we're not compliant so yeah it's, it's changed a little bit in that way but um it's yeah yeah I do feel I feel lucky that we the business have supported this idea all along it has not meant that it's all been smooth sailing like the uh, you know the the exec team can really get behind something and and say yes we support this wholeheartedly and really mean it but it's the the next layer down I think of management that is is the challenge so that layer for me has to be more of a one one-on-one -on -one conversation because they're the ones with the priorities and they're the ones that have all this competing stuff happening so um yeah I think the business case and the strategy has to change when you're talking to that group of people because it has to be then about how can we how can we help them meet their targets and their goals and not get in the way yeah and that's always the the key right being able to have accessibility but have everything else that people want at the same time and helping them to understand where those where that balance needs to sit do you find you're still having to talk to those that, that, that mid-level executive kind of group even today, even four years in, and that it's kind of an ongoing discussion? Yeah, totally, totally. Um, so we work in tribes and squads, um, and I would say our yeah our tribe tribe leads are the, the the people that I guess I'm talking about. Um, there's just so much change all the time, and everyone has so much to do, and we're very fast moving. Um, business so there's not a lot of time to sort of settle into things um so it does always change people change and um, the, the the focus changes and um yeah it's we're also when we're trying to really embed what we're doing so we work a lot on trying to get accessibility best practice into our processes so I'm talking from the very beginning of, you know, building requirements out all through design and content writing and development and testing. Um, when we're trying to embed those processes, we've, you know, we've got so far, which is great, but then to get to the next level, you have to have an extra conversation to say, okay, what about this? Um, and then the next level again, it's every step of the way I feel is a conversation. And but the more you do, the more things are embedded, the easier these conversations are. Um, I can give an example, actually, of uh, we use AQUA or AQA, as we call it. I don't know. Is that a British thing that we just call it AQA or do all of my, all of my Americans call it AQUA? It varies. I hear AQA occasionally in the States, too, because okay. uh, people can't decide if it's AQUA thinking about like the color, you know, yeah. AQUA or like water is being AQUA. Uh, yeah. AQA, AQUA, both are good. Okay, cool. So we use this um, and we love it. So at the moment we have a group of accessibility champions running um, Aqua and we now share the uh, the results of all of the weekly audits that we do, we share with our tribes. And this is great. It goes onto their reports um, that all of the tribe sees and it's up there with all of the other big uh, metrics that they're they're reporting on and they're tracking. And it just gets the, the bugs fixed. It's great. Um, they care about it. So it was there. But what we want to do now is, so those so those conversations have been had and that's all great. That took a while. But then the next step is, okay, we've been providing this stuff to you. Now we want you to, to do it yourself. Um, you know, so that's going to be the next challenge. So I, I think it's just ongoing. Like it's, it never ends. It will never end. Things will constantly change and grow and um. Yeah, we just need people in the business to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the key, right? You could keep saying, please do this. And then it's like, somebody's got to take the reins and, and go for it. Yes. You talked about embedding accessibility into those processes. And I'm curious, some of the strategies that you went to from 
you know, accessibility being this project as you identified all the issues as you were kind of coming in and getting those remediated to come maybe come back to a good, you know, let's call it baseline of accessibility, wherever that was. But then however your strategy is about getting it embedded so it started being part of the broader SDLC for the for the for the tribes and that software development life cycle sorry for anybody that doesn't know SDLC. Um, it was I mean it is a gradual process for sure. Um, the very first thing I remember seeing the company wide strategy had five different pillars in it and accessibility was mentioned quite low down in one of them but that, that was a win you know because it had never been on that before. Um, and because it was there, it, it allowed me to have many more conversations with with people about, OK, well, it's, it's in the strategy. So, you know, we need to we need to talk about how we're going to do it. Um, and over time, it has become um, part of our production standards. So we have our web production standards and our app production standards and accessibility is now firmly there in both. And more recently, um, the engineering team have produced a, a software delivery handbook which is also in. So, you know, this is just, again, embedding it into just, this is how we do stuff now, it's there. Um, so that has been, that's been a gradual thing. Also um, from working with the design team a lot, um, it used to be quite, uh, some designers would be thinking about it and others wouldn't, but we now have implemented a um, annotation, an accessibility annotation toolkit into Figma. We we borrowed Twitter's version and we kind of tweaked it and made it our own. And that's great because the designers have now all been trained on how to use this. And now they are marking up their designs before they get handed over into engineering. And that's that's great. And it's also part of the design team's quality checking process now. So we do have some checkboxes. Actually, some of the checkboxes are, have you marked up your design with these things? So, um, you know, it's just all, it's all becoming more more and more um, embedded, but the, the accessibility strategy still, you know, it exists on its own. Um, and it's just made a lot more visible now because I can't remember how long ago this was, about a year, year and a half ago, something magic happened and the business said, let's join four important areas of the business together. And that was accessibility, diversity, equity, and inclusion, communities, which was our like charities um, section and um, sustainability. So the four areas came together and a lot of, were mainly quite small teams, you know, the, the sustainability, well, yeah, there's two or three people in each of those teams. Um, so we came together under a banner called Positive Impact. And that has been fantastic because that's the first time that we are now officially reporting to the exec and we're actually now officially reporting to the board um, in a very small way, but it's it's actually it's actually being reported on um, on a monthly basis, sorry, a quarterly basis. So that's a big change, you know, going from just this little side of desk thing where people are trying to do the right thing and um, make things a little bit better every day to actually, no, we're serious about this. Tell me your progress, show me your roadmap. So I now have to um, have a, a roadmap that's updated every um, every quarter um, and, you know, talk about why things have worked and why things haven't. And, but it's good. It's, it just means that we are now following the same processes as all the other um departments in the in the business who are accountable um for, for progress so uh yeah i'm really really happy with that and i should have said earlier that i now actually report to the chief product officer as well so when i first started talking about accessibility i was getting things approved by my manager who's man and manager 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 and then it was like the the cpo um but I'm sure some people listening will will know this as well. It's a struggle where where the accessibility team sits because mm -hmm. we we touch so many different parts of the business. Um, where should we sit? And I still actually don't know. I actually wonder if it's where you should sit where you get the most support. Um, so I do have great support from um, um my chief product officer, and it's just great to be. It's just easy, you know, directly with him, and um, everything gets resolve very quickly um and i'm yeah i get a, a good budget every year and can pretty much do but well, i can suggest a lot of things that i want to do <laughs> yeah it's really the pinnacle everybody hopes for because having that exec 
you know, lead person who can advocate so you're not going up the management ladder to get everything approved is, is the pinnacle. One of the interesting things, Heather, I think you, you touched on there and that I think people have kind of gotten the idea of, you've been working on this for four years now and it's still an evolving thing. It's not like, hey, we've got a great process and we're, we're done now. It's been more of, you know, having to take the minute to continue to have the conversations and continue to evolve. Do you think it ever stops? Like, will you get to a place where like, oh, okay, the, uh, the, the, the process is good so we can kind of use this and stand firm? Definitely not. It'll just, I, it will never be like that. We, when I hear about accessibility teams being cut in other businesses, it's, I honestly do not understand it for a second. How can, how can it happen? Um, I mean, there's something to be said for as, as capability across the business improves. So when, as people, you know, they've done their training, they've been working on it for a while now, they're doing it most of the time. Okay, there's something maybe there that you don't need um, people, I don't know. I, actually, I don't know, who would you cut? Who would you actually cut from a, from a team? But um, no, you can't. There's so much so much is changing all the time, particularly with technology. I mean, all of the stuff that's happening now around AI and all of the improvements that are happening across all the big platforms, we need to respond to that. You can't just, can't just be left to, you know, do it the way you were doing it two years ago and then hope that works for, forever. No, yeah, it's an ongoing um, developing thing. It's a lot like accessibility itself. Doing accessibility work never stops. It's always progress over perfection. And it's very similar with setting process as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Totally true. Did you have particular strategies that worked for you as you were like gathering your advocates and starting to, you know, have these organizations or having these conversations? Yeah. Um, I think the gathering the advocates was the, the the first thing actually that was um yeah the the very first thing we did when we first met and and chatted about what had been happening in in skyscanner um and there wasn't much happening that first group that i got together um we got together in march 2019 and we have met every month since um and they are now my accessibility champions network and they I mean, it's grown so much. Um, it was the, it was called the Accessibility Guild when I, well, we had a Slack channel called the Accessibility Guild when I joined. And then we became like a group called the Accessibility Guild. And then after a couple of years, I realized, okay, we're all quite keen on talking about this, but there's not so much being done. Like there's not as much activity as I would like to see. And you know the restrictions around growing a big team if they're there there then you need you need help from somewhere so i restructured the the guild to become the accessibility champions network and um the restructure included an onboarding process so people had to do a little bit of training um first and then they had to have a one to one with me and that was great because i got to speak to everyone from all all areas of the business about what they wanted to learn, what they, what activity they might want to do. Um, and we came up with some brilliant ideas. You know, if someone else had said something as well that was similar, I could put them in touch and they could start working on things together. But I guess the main difference was that I restructured it so that it was in pods. So rather than everyone being in this one big group all the time, um, I grouped people into disciplines. So we had a, we have an engineering pod um, that is web app and systems engineers and we have a pod lead and then we have a product makers pod and that's um, product designers content designers researchers product owners localization um, and then we have a marketing and communications pod and that's everyone who's doing the outward facing stuff so social media um, user satisfaction advertising marketing content that um and then we have an internal pod, which is all of the internal facing groups. So like finance, um, uh, the people team, legal. So when we first moved into these pods, I was able to ask really good champions if they would be the pod leads. So I suddenly had this like mini team from nowhere, which was great. Um, and the pod leads ran sessions with just their pod. 
So they had these brilliant, brilliant um, workshops at the early, in the early stages, and they were all trying to work out what they could do in their areas to improve accessibility. And I wanted them all to come up with a set of goals and then to break those goals down and actually come up with, um, you know, actual actions that they could do. Um, and it was fantastic. The amount of work that was actually done at that point was phenomenal. Um, and it was just giving people a bit of freedom and a bit of, you know, what do you want to do? OK, well, let's try and make that happen. Um, and now that's kind of it, we've still got that structure. Uh, we all come together every two months now, but the, the pods still meet up um, on a monthly basis and, and do some work. Um, and we're now kind of... the. the the business has changed a little bit in how we set our own personal goals. We now have a thing called commitments. So six months ago, when they first came out, um, we were able to say, OK, you, you can have an accessibility commitment because it's about helping the culture of the organisation. So if you can say if you can write a commitment that actually shows it's laddering up to the accessibility strategy, you can do it. So everyone was allowed kind of five or six commitments. And it was really nice that the business then said also, and you can have one that relates to our culture. So it could have been on any of the, um, the positive impact areas, but that was that was fantastic. So people are actually committing to doing a piece of activity. They're talking to their manager about it. The manager's agreeing. And then that work is actually being done and they're being then recognized and rewarded for it. So that's another way of, that was a very long winded way actually, sorry, of, of saying that the Accessibility Champions Network is a great thing to have. Um, another strategy though that we've used that I wanted to mention was our empathy lamps. Um, so that was one of the things we did very early on um, where we set up a lab that had different stations where we simulated different disabilities and we got staff to come and um, be temporarily disabled and try and carry out a task. And they have been so well received since we started doing them. And we did them all in a number of different offices, um, at a number of different events. And now we the business has asked us to do them at every global induction session. So global induction is where all of the new people who started in the business come together um, for two days in Edinburgh. So wherever they are, if they're in the China office, they still come and um, they have two days and we run a lab in one of the afternoons and I get to talk to them about um, the importance of accessibility. So that is fantastic because that is every single new person coming in, getting the information about the importance of it, how we do it, um, what they can do in their role. And it also gives me the chance to meet them all. And during the empathy lab, I can find the ones that are particularly interested in them. Say, mm, would you like to be a champion? <laughs> um, yeah, so it's great. It's that's been that's been super super effective as well. Um, there's yeah, there's lots of other things. So I, I think I've forgotten the question now. I love so much hearing what you just said. Uh, getting to talk to global induction that way to tell everybody how important accessibility is at Skyscanner, here's why, finding your additional advocates. The fact that you mentioned, you know, having specifically like finance and legal and HR or people, you know, the people, people, the people, people, um, <laughs> in, in that kind of group and making them think about accessibility too. So it's not just the people on the digital teams, for example, it's taking and broadening that out. What's been a key challenge in all that? Uh, there's been a few challenges. Um, <laughs> I, I actually think the main, well, I mean, the one I was talking earlier about the, the, the management layer, having all of the competing priorities, that's definitely a challenge because work gets paused for the, you know, that, that, that is a challenge. But I actually think generally the biggest challenge is knowledge gap. I think not many graduates come out of university or college, whether they're engineers, designers, and whatever their role is, not many of them have even heard about accessibility. And it's, I, I, I can't quite get my head around that because it seems to me like such an important part of all of these roles. Um, and the fact it's not even mentioned sometimes, or, or maybe there was, a, there was an optional module once that you know people opted out of. So, that I think is the biggest challenge um, because then it means we have to train them 
that's not part of their natural way of going about their job. Um, so it has to, it's a little bit of a battle to firstly get people understanding how to do it, but then getting them to do it on a regular basis. Whereas if it was just part of what they were learning over the four years of becoming whatever they are, they would just naturally do it. Um, and I've tried to I've tried to do something about this. Well, I've started off anyway in a small way, but I um, we're working with Edinburgh University and St Andrews University, and we're trying to help them start embedding accessibility into their curriculums. So um, we've done it actually different ways with both, just because we're working organically with them and, and seeing what works for them. But with Edinburgh, um, I've done a, I guess, lecture, we've done an, an, an empathy lab that's, that went down really well. And we have sponsored an award called the Skyscanner Accessibility and Inclusion Award. And that we're just actually about we've started judging them today um and they're being presented in graduation at, at the first week of july so it's for the student the final year student with the dissertation that best solves an accessibility or inclusion problem and they've had to like fill in a submission form and everything so we've got amazing little videos of of their solutions and it's fantastic. So we're doing a bit of judging and then we'll speak to the university staff as well and we'll agree on a winner. And So that's what we're doing at Edinburgh. But at St Andrews, we were working with the third year computer science students on the project they were doing and they all had to do this project and they were doing something to do with um, wiki data and data visualisation. And they were visualising this stuff, but then as a twist, um, accessibility was brought in a few months after they'd started the project so again we did a lecture we did a that this was an online empathy lab to the students and we just basically told them the basics of how to make um data visualization accessible and we attended the demos of these projects and we were blown away by what these students had done the knowledge that they now have just from being given a task at uni to go and have a think about it research it, build it into your project. It was fantastic. We were so surprised at the quality. It was actually brilliant. Um, yes, I'm just seeing the uh, Teach Access. Yes, thank you. I've actually got a conversation with Teach Access um, next week to talk about, yeah, is it relevant to UK education? I don't know. So um, we're gonna have we're gonna have that chat. Uh, so I think there's a lot we can do there, but uh, yeah, that's that is I think the biggest problem for us right now is that is that knowledge gap. Is that how you is that how you feel in the US as well? It surprises me how not existent it is in education. Um, the web content accessibility guidelines are not new. You know, they, those just went past their twenty fifth anniversary. I think earlier this year, and I've done some guest lecturing in graduate level design courses. And those designers are like, how am I in graduate level design? And this guest lecture is the first time I've heard about accessibility. I don't, I don't understand how that happens. Yeah. And so, yeah, it absolutely causes problems getting people into the organization who know it. Because only if you come from an organization where it was made top of mind, or for some reason you have taken it upon yourself to learn it, it's not there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Isn't it? Yeah, I love what you're doing and being allowed to have the time to do it. Skyscanner to work with the universities. That's amazing. And, you know, thinking about sustainability, what do you consider the most crucial components of the sustainability of the Skyscanner program? So I do think having someone to lead it is really important. And you said earlier, Jeff, that not every company that you're working with has an accessibility specialist. So you're maybe working with, I don't know, lead engineers or product folks, or unless it's someone's job, I think it's very easy for it to fall away. And that can be for so many different reasons. It can be business reasons, different priorities again, or the, the, the person who was leading it, not having capacity to do it anymore. But as soon as you have someone in place that is their responsibility, oh, well, accessibility is everyone's responsibility, but the, the progress of the program is someone's responsibility, then you have then you have roadmaps, you have strategies, you have metrics, you have someone actually being accountable for growing these things. I think that is key. 
Um, and then that person can hopefully grow a team. Um, I think I mentioned I have a, a lead accessibility engineer, which is fantastic. That's been life changing for me. Um, so he was already in the business and one of one of our great accessibility champions. So he was leading the engineering pod, still is, um, but we managed to get him into a more permanent role. Um, and having that broad base of champions has been has been fantastic as well. So those two things I think help to sustain it. But I've I have to, I mean, you have to continually, continually raise awareness. Um, even now that everyone knows about it, you know, going through global induction, we still have to talk about it a lot. Um, we want to talk about it a lot. So Go Global Accessibility Awareness Day was just there. We did loads. We did stuff in over the whole week. So we were doing workshops um, on how to actually test with a screen reader or a keyboard and things. Um, we did a blog every day. Um, I had a, I led a panel discussion. We had three disabled travelers come and talk to me. Um, that was a whole company wide invite. So everyone could come to that and, and hear from different different travelers. It was brilliant. Um, and we was um, Gert, my engineer, was speaking at a conference in Beijing on accessibility as well. It was just fantastic. So all of this stuff is happening. Um, yeah, we do more of it in that week, but it's happening throughout the year. And we just have to keep shouting about it and keep reminding people that we're that why it's important. Um, yeah, and keep going. But that the embedding into processes, I think, is super important for this as well. The sustainability of it. The more you can get it in to these processes the better because it's quite hard to, to unpick them then. So um, we've tried to look at existing processes. So I'm, I'm trying not to like bombard any teams with any massive new things that they have to do because I know that they're not going to do them. But if you can understand what they're, what they're doing already and you're just adding five minutes to whatever they're already doing and helping them understand the value of that, it's so much more sustainable um, for them to do it like that. So we're at the moment, we're just trying to embed accessibility into squads definitions of done. Um, and we started with four squads and we got it working with the four squads. Now they all do things completely in their own way as well. They're so autonomous, which is great in some ways, but it means that you can't just have a you know blanket approach to, to process because everyone's doing their own thing. So we worked with four, um, went really well, and then they helped advocate the next with the next four, and we're just working through the teams like that, and it's making yeah, it's making such a difference. Um, but it's, that's all pretty time consuming as well. Yeah, I like the strategy you've got there. Of course, where it's like set it with some teams, and then let the those teams help advocate and move it other places because then there's proof that it works. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I love that. Thinking about the sustainability and what you mentioned about people not, you know, being trained on this before they arrive at Skyscanner, what kind of ongoing training do you have to help people not only, you know, learn the basics, of course, as they're starting, but then continue to keep up on their various specialties, whether it's design, development, QA, et cetera, so that they, you know, they're always staying sharp and on top of new things. Yeah, I wish I had a better answer for this because it, <laughs> <laughs> things would be different if I did. Um, so we have the little training that the champions do before they can become a champ, as I mentioned. Then once they are a champ, they have access to um, actually DQ's university, um, accessibility university. So it's a bunch of self-led online training modules um, that they can do. And I'd love to say that that has gone down really well, but it hasn't. Um, I don't think, I don't know if this is across the board, but Skyscanner staff, I don't think, do great on self-led online training. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're looking at the numbers every month going, okay, trying a few different strategies to get people to do a bit more of it. And, you know, it's it's not that straightforward. So um, recently we have a um, an accessibility consultant Dean Burkett um, who's amazing he he helps us uh, on a regular basis with our component library um, I should have mentioned that the sustainability stuff as well if you have um, accessibility component accessible components um, in your and in your design library if you're lucky enough to have one then that is a good way of, of having a sustainable future but um, 
yeah, so Dean um, created some training for just the product design team. Um, and the, that, that includes content designers as well. And it was great because it was really specific about what they were doing. It was very, very relevant to their work. Um, and it resulted in a bit of a workshop on how to use our accessibility annotation toolkit. So it's very practical. It meant that they were actually doing some hands-on stuff and they were interested. So that approach works um, in our business. And I mean, I remember when I very first started out, I had a training deck and I went around all of the squads. Well, I went around about 45 different teams. Um, I couldn't have been doing much else at the time because it was time consuming, but I went around all of them and that was that was effective. It was two hours face-to-face talking to them about accessibility and about the work that they were doing so again it, it was just the making it relevant I think is is the key and we haven't we haven't solved that problem um yet so we're gonna have to rethink how we do do it at scale I mean we have talked about mandatory training you know would that be possible across our business I still don't know if it would be um again I don't think not everyone has to be a specialist either so there's that to consider um, you know, we don't want to force hours and hours of training on, on people who really don't need it. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's, it's a challenge again, workshops that we've done have been the best. We, we, uh, we do screen reader workshops that are quite, um, long, like six or three hours on mobile, three hours on desktop face-to-face and it's great um so I I feel that that's the doing you know learning by doing seems to be the effective way um but yeah we've not quite solved that it's hard because often there's so many other things to do self-led training can be very difficult to do um I think I've seen a couple of people actually like almost organize a group watching of the training so you're all watching it together then you can talk about it and that helps a little bit but yeah it's still yeah. making the time for it yeah it's something a future thing to crack for sure mm. um before we get into some q a heather uh because we've got some great questions that have come in uh from the audience i'm curious about the measurement of success because that's always so important you're re- you're reporting up to people in the c-suite and other places in the org what are the metrics of success that you're looking at both in those reports and then maybe personal ones that you have that you kind of track on the side maybe too so there's two there's two main metrics that we've been using for a number of years. Um, the first one is our AQA metric. Um, so when we first started auditing our products, we were sitting at sixty nine percent average accessible. Now that was our that was the automated auditing, so we know that that is not covering the full range of potential issues at all. But it was a really really good place to start. So we started at sixty nine and. Last year, I think our goal was 85, which we reached. And this year, our goal is 95%, which we've already reached. Um, So we're delighted, delighted with that. Um, That is the top line um, metric that my boss has on his, one of his commitments is to support me to get the business to 95% accessible on the automated audits using AQA. the fact, as I've said, that it's there and that all of the tribes are now looking at it. Okay, it's automated. It's not covering everything, but it's it's established a process. So now we can go, okay, let's broaden that a bit. Now that you're all doing so well here, we'll just broaden that and we'll, you know, we'll start looking at the more manual stuff. So that's top line. Then the second big one that we do is we measure the maturity of our program using a digital accessibility maturity model. We use AbilityNet's um, maturity model called the DAM. Um, and that's been super effective as well. I have a little chart that has we have plotted where we were back in 2020 and where we are now across different dimensions and um, different levels of maturity. So it's a really visual thing. Um, and I've even, you know, I've showed that to the CEO because it's a really clear look. This is where we were. This is where we are. And this is where we want to get to. So that's really nice. And that actually informs a lot of the strategy, um, you know, because we're, we're better at some areas of that than others. So we have to put focus on the areas where we're not so good at. So that's been worth its weight in gold as well. And then on the side, yeah, there's little metrics like the number of champions we have, the number of squads with um, accessibility and the definition of done, that, you know, that kind of thing. Those are more um, 
depending on what we're working on, you know, how many people have completed the training, depending on what our strategy is for that year or that half, we'll have those smaller um, KPIs as well. That's awesome. I love hearing how well this is going. Um, I want to get to some of the questions that we've got. I think you and I could probably talk another hour easily on just <laughs> all of this stuff. One of the things that we got in the questions is just to understand, uh, you know, how do you navigate some of this and what strategies did you actually take to start to embed accessibility standards into your SDLC so that you were then able to kind of, you know, spread out so, and deal with some of those challenges that I'm sure people are facing. So the embedding into processes thing um, has been very gradual over over a number of years. Um, it's about we've tried a few things that haven't worked as well. So it, it's really about understanding the existing processes of the teams. Not easy when they are always changing as well. Um, but as I said, it was it, we found it way more effective if you can add on a little bit around accessibility to an existing process. So, for example, the um, design quality assurance checks, that was being developed. I knew it was being developed, so I took some time to understand what they were doing, what their goals were, and took time to explain where accessibility would be good to sit in this in this process. And there was, you know, there's a few different um, touch points for it as well. So it was not just a one off, but that took a lot of conversations back and forward and trying to trying to keep things um, short and sweet but meaningful. So not coming in and killing a process, you know, with even more process. It was it was trying to um, enhance it. Um, so I think it's a two, it's a de definitely a two-way thing. You have to understand what the other people are trying to do and what their goals really are. Mm -hmm. And they always be mindful of that. Or, or you're just not going to get anywhere. Um, and it's the same with the engineering processes. Like we could have gone in and just written a massive big production standards for app and web, but really have to look at the other production standards, look to see, okay, what are people used to looking at here or used to adhering to? You write it in the same way with the same amount of um, work from their side. You know, I, I, it's just about, it's, it's that two-way understanding, I think has, is, has really, really helped. And that's where the one-on-one -on -one chats get go really well. I know Gert actually um, interviewed all, all of the squad leads in over in China um, and all of the product managers to understand their issues so if we can understand what they're struggling with, we can then tailor what we're trying to do to help them rather than hinder them. Another question uh, that I suspect might be our last one, uh, but connects to what you were just talking about. We've got a, somebody who's curious about what, what some of the aha moments are that you've had when you're teaching others about web accessibility. You know, those things are like, you see the light bulbs go off in their head. Uh, what are some of the key ones and maybe how can people tease those out of people when they're talking yeah. to them about this? Um, it's all the relatable stuff. It's the stuff that you can make almost personal. So the light, I have seen the light bulbs happen above people's heads during our empathy labs because people are put in situations that they've not really considered before or their grandmother has arthritis or their sister has um, whatever we're simulating, macular degeneration or um, whatever. And that is brilliant when they can go, I didn't know this was like this for someone I know and care about. And they then become really super, super interested. And even those who don't have those personal um, relations, they, they, I think people, when they learn something new like that, which is so powerful, like something that can be so wrong, but so like fixed so easily, um, that can be enough to make people really, wow. And I think it's helped us when we've been showing, I mean, the Empathy Labs is like this as well, but at the very beginning, and still actually, we still show people who are struggling with using our product. But at the beginning, I remember it being really impactful because people, it was just blocker, blocker, blocker. You know, we had a, um, a screen reader user trying to get through a web page, couldn't do it. And you show that to the team who've built it or you show that to the wider engineering org or anyone, there it's embarrassing and it's, it's, it's no one 
you know, we want to fix that. So I think those those are the moments that if you can do them in the right way, we're not blaming anyone because a lot of people, it's just, you know, people just don't know a lot of the time. It's just, this is what's happening, isn't this? We, we can fix this. And people then get really, really behind it. Um, I think showing the showing the ease of, I mean, accessibility can be really complex, but I think there's so much um, of it that is pretty straightforward. Um, like colour, I mean, colour color contrast is such an easy one to fix right um but if people just are unaware of it it can cause so many problems i think like we had 25 percent of our app bugs used to be on low color contrast um and the design team kind of fixed the color palette it was brilliant accessibility was one of the things uh, one of the reasons why they they looked at it again and just put some rules around color usage and tweaked some of the colors and reduced the color palette for the product so it just meant that those things weren't happening anymore. Those issues weren't happening. And that's really nice when, you know, I think that there was light bulb moments there when the design team realized this is so easy to fix. We could do this. And there were other benefits for it as well. It's not just, it wasn't just accessibility benefits. Um, so yeah, someone's just saying 100% on the low hanging fruit with the big impacts. That's where you start. Um, that's the easy stuff to fix and, you know, get people interested in that. And then they want to find out a bit more about uh, the rest of it. I think. Mm -hmm. Morning again, and special thanks to our panelists, Jeff and Heather. Uh, thank you for being with us today. And that's going to go ahead and conclude today's webinar.